What are the first signs that come to your mind from all the messages you have heard in your life about the signs that point to the second coming of Christ? I've heard a lot of sermons in my younger days and as I heard them, I, the signs that would come most frequently to my mind is the wars and rumors of wars and tsunamis and earthquakes and uh, Israel coming into the land, etc., etc. But one of the th things that I have sought to do is to try and approach the scriptures with a mind that is completely open, not bound by the traditions I inherited from my church background. What is the sign of the Lord's coming? Now let me turn you to Matthew 24. When the disciples asked Jesus, what is the sign of your coming? That's a specific question. What will be the sign of your coming? Matthew 24, verse 3. What is the first thing Jesus said? Not about Israel, not about wars, not about tsunamis, not about earthquakes. What is the first thing he said? Make sure nobody deceives you. Deception is going to be one of the greatest characteristics of the last days. And that's the only thing he kept on repeating. Wars and rumors of wars, he said in one verse, verse 6, and never mentioned it again. Israel, if you count Israel as the fig tree, he mentioned it in verse 32 once, and that was it. But when it came to deception, he kept on repeating it. See to it that no one misleads you, verse 4. Verse 11, many false prophets will arise and mislead many. Again, deception. And again, it's, he says in those, uh, verse 23, if someone says to you that here is Christ and there is Christ, don't believe them. Because many false Christs, false prophets will arise and even show great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. Behold, I have told you in advance, verse 25, deception is going to be the greatest characteristic of the last days. And when you turn to the epistles, you find the same thing. It's consistent. What Jesus said is repeated by the Holy Spirit. In 1 Timothy chapter 4, it says the Spirit explicitly says now when the everything is written by the Holy Spirit in the New Testament in the Bible what does it mean the Spirit explicitly says hasn't he said all the other things this is like when you get a letter from your father and he underlines some things or you get an email from someone and it is highlighted in bold or in red that's the meaning of this if Paul were writing an email he would Put this in bold and in red. The Spirit explicitly says that in the last days, some will fall away from the faith. This is talking about believers. It's not Hindus and Muslims who fall away from the faith. They're not in the faith at all. It's people who are in the faith, Christians who will fall away from it. How? Paying attention to deceitful spirits. Now, if you believe that you're in the last days, and you read this highlighted, bold, underlined statement of the Holy Spirit that people will fall away from the faith listening to deceiving spirits. Boy, that, you'd be very alert on that. Lord, I don't want to be deceived. I don't want to be deceived. How can I protect myself from deception? Great apostles like Paul, Peter, different ones come and preach. How do I know whether they're preaching what's right? Be like the Bereans. Ask them to show it to you in Scripture. Compare what they say with Scripture. I do not listen to people who just get up and hardly ever quote the word of God. If you have heard any of my sermons, you'll find that almost every five minutes I quote a scripture. You know why? Because I do not want your faith to stand in the wisdom of my cleverness, but in the word of God. And most people don't know the word of God enough to be able to tell you where the scripture is. They say, yeah, it says this, says that. How do I know, brother? Please show it to me in scripture. I don't have to go to the synagogue during the week now. I've got the Bible right with me. Tell me where it is. Another verse, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Again, speaking about the last days, we request you, brethren, with regard to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together, our rapture with him. Let me tell you something, he says, that day will not come. The rapture will not take place. Verse 3, until the Antichrist is revealed, the man of sin. 
For so many years I believed, because I was taught that, that we'll be raptured before the Antichrist and the tribulation. I believed it for years and I even taught it. Till I studied the scriptures more carefully and I got rid of this theological mold that I had formed, pouring every verse into it. I threw it in the trash and I said, I want to go to the, like the Bereans and search the scriptures. And I discovered that the church will go through the tribulation and then Christ will come. Like Jesus said, like the lightning shines from one end of the sky. Don't believe those who say, ah, oh, Christ has come here secretly there. Don't believe it, he said. Second Thessalonians chapter 2. He goes on to say that the Antichrist will rise, one who opposes and exalts himself. And then he says, be careful because in the last days, verse 9, this one is going to come with the activity of Satan. Second Thessalonians 2, 9, with power, signs and false wonders. So one of the things I'm warned about in the last days is there's going to be a lot of miracles being done by people who are not really leading you to Jesus. They will come in his name, but they will not manifest his character. I see one thing about Jesus' ministry. He never took any money from the people he healed. I don't see a single example of that in scripture. Never, 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 never. And he did far greater miracles than anybody's ever done. I never see the apostles taking money from those who they prayed for healing. But that is the main thing I see today. And that proves to me these are not servants of God. You can disagree with me if you like. If you listen to me in the day of judgment, you'll thank me for being protected from deception. Do not be deceived, my brothers and sisters. Then he goes on to say, these people come, verse 10, with all the deception of wickedness for those who perish. And listen to this, because they did not receive the love of the truth so as to be saved. I want you to think of this little expression. It's very important. Receiving, verse 10, the love of the truth so as to be saved. Receiving the love of the truth so as to be saved. Not just accepting the truth, but loving the truth. Not just loving the truth, but loving the truth so as to be saved. Not to be saved from the Romans, not to be saved from hell, not to be saved from sickness, but to be saved from sin. Thou shalt call his name Jesus because he shall save his people from the sicknesses? No. He shall save his people from the Romans? No. He shall save his people from hell? No. He shall save his people from their sins. That's the meaning. Matthew 1 21, the first promise in the New Testament. He shall save his people from their sins. That is the love of the truth so as to be saved. And now listen to what I call the scariest verse in the New Testament. You think the scariest verse is going to hell? No. The scariest verse in the New Testament is verse 11 of 2 Thessalonians 2 that God himself will deceive you. Now I'll tell you, the devil is called a deceiver. Revelation 12 8 to 10. The devil is a deceiver of the whole world. Ephesians 4 verse 22 I think says, my lusts are deceitful. The devil is deceitful. He's a deceiver. My lusts are deceitful. Jeremiah 17 verse 9 says, the heart is deceitful above all things. Look at the things that are out to deceive me. Satan, my lusts, a heart, my only salvation is if God protects me from deception and if God also begins to deceive me I'm doomed and it says your God will deceive some people read it have you read that verse that's why I say it's the scariest verse in the New Testament if Almighty God also joins the forces to deceive me I'm finished there's no hope for me I can think I'm very clever I'm smart I know the Bible but if God tries to deceive me I'm finished the devil can try as much as he likes. If God is on my side, the devil will not be able to deceive me. My lust will not be able to deceive me. My heart will not be able to deceive me. I must have God on my side. Now, who are the people whom God allows to be deceived? Who are the people? It says God will send upon them a deluding influence so that they may believe what is false. You mean God makes people believe what is false? Read your scripture. 
God will make them believe a lie. He'll make them believe they are born again when they are not born again. I have met numerous people like that. He will make them believe that they are filled with the Spirit when they are not filled with the Spirit. They don't manifest the Spirit of Christ. He'll make them believe that they have a certain gift of the Spirit when they don't have the gift of the Spirit. Don't be satisfied that people think you're spiritual. Live before God and see, are you overcoming sin? Let me show you one verse. James chapter 1. James chapter 1 and verse, I'll show you one area where a lot of Christians are deceiving themselves. James 1, 26. James 1, 26, it says, if anyone thinks himself to be religious or what we would call spiritual and he cannot control his tongue, his whole Christianity is worth zero. If anyone thinks he's spiritual and he cannot control his tongue, he loses his temper, he backbites and gossips, 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 he cannot control his tongue, his whole Christianity is worth zero whatever version of Christianity he has. Baptist, brethren, Pentecostal, whatever it is. If he cannot control his tongue, his religion, his Christianity is worth zero. I'd like to know how many Christians believe that. I could not control my tongue when I got married. I, I didn't know about victory over sin those days. I was born again, but I didn't know victory over sin. I didn't take this verse seriously. But I remember the day I took this verse seriously. I saw people who would speak in tongues, in other tongues, in the Pentecostal church Sunday morning and in the afternoon in their mother tongue shouted their wife. I said, what type of language is this? You mean the spirit can control your other tongues but cannot control your mother tongue? That can't be the Holy Spirit. I said, I don't want that. I said, Lord, I don't, I'm not able to control my mother tongue. I don't want just other tongues. I want control over my mother tongue as well. That's how I knew that my other tongues was genuine. If the Holy Spirit cannot control my mother tongue and I say I've got some other tongues, I'd say I'm fooling myself. How is it that the Holy Spirit can give you an unknown language but cannot control your mother tongue? Is that really the Holy Spirit or some other spirit? There are Muslims who speak in tongues, Buddhists who speak in tongues. It's not from the Holy Spirit. So let's take these scriptures seriously. And if I'm honest, that's all you got to do. Go to scripture, be like the Bereans, compare everything in your life with God's word. And you'll never be deceived. God has given us his, his inspired word to guide us, protect us from deception in these last days. To protect us from deceivers. Compare every preacher with Jesus. Dear brothers and sisters, I have shared the truth with you. I hope you will take seriously we are approaching the coming of Christ we should not be ashamed when he comes let's wake up that old gospel that some of your ancestors who lived 80 years ago and experienced the power of the Holy Spirit in Romania they had the truth some of us have drifted away from that they had godliness they had poverty you know they were not so wealthy as you they didn't have all the gadgets you have in your home but they had godliness let's go back to that gospel which they had a genuine power of the holy spirit that's what we need in our day